uh, let me start. My first paper is on critical events that occur before a spinal cord injury in a pig model. Now, iatrogenic spinal cord injury, as we all know, is a devastating complication of spine surgery. Most of these are secondary to cord manipulation, like in spinal deformity surgery, scoliosis, or compression intraoperatively. For example, a breech screw, the entire screw is in the canal, and of course, not a happy spinal cord. Spine manipulation and spinal deformity surgery, a direct injury, your, spinal, your cob uh, slips uh, into an open laminectomy, a defect, and now you have a problem. Now, spinal cord injury from compression or distraction has spinal cord ischemia as its pathogenesis. In fact, there are three steps to a spinal cord injury. The first step is essentially vascular ischemia as the, as the compression is pressing, uh, is pressing down on the spinal cord, or there's hyperperfusion, there's ischemia. As ischemia evolves, as the compression increases, the second step is mechanical in nature. So there's pressure directly in the spinal cord. And as both of these are evolving with further compression, the last step is chemical and oftentimes that is also reactionary. So if you have an ability to measure the spinal cord blood flow and detect hypoperfusion, which is an early step of spinal cord injury, well, you may be able to avoid a spinal cord injury altogether. Think of it as like diagnosing an angina before a heart attack. And this can be done. A laser Doppler uh, is something that can measure spinal cord blood flow. The way it is done is a tiny sensor is placed on the dura. It sends a laser beam. A flowing RBC scatter the, the beam, allowing for a blood flow measurement. Laser Doppler can detect hyperemia, hyperperfusion, and ischemia. And ischemia, if detected early, when MEPs are still present, well, that can be a game changer. At present, when MEPs disappear, well, we know that there's a spinal cord injury that has happened. We just do not know if it is a permanent one, if it is a temporary one, if it is complete, or if it's incomplete. But a spinal cord injury has happened. Imagine if you're able to detect even before the MEPs are lost, so you can abort the surgery, and well, your patient will wake up fine. So the question really is, can laser Doppler detect ischemia before MEP loss? What changes occur at the spinal cord before spinal cord injury is detected in MEP? And can reversal of these changes lead to a return of MEP? Well, this was an institutional animal care and use committee, I cook approved study. 14 farm bred pigs weighing 200 pounds, so much bigger than me. Pigs were used because closest, they were closest to humans anatomically, physiologically. The cord size and function is also similar. Non-paralytic anesthesia, just the way for scoliosis surgery, fentanyl and propofol. So total intravenous anesthesia was utilized. Right carotid uh, mean arterial pressure was measured. Trust me, it's very difficult to do a femoral cut down in pigs. Body temperature was measured utilizing an esophageal probe. SpO2 was measured. pH was maintained at 7.4. And neuromonitoring of upper and lower limbs, as you can see on the right side. So essentially, a standard scoliosis setup was utilized. We performed a three-level mid-thoracic laminectomy. A laser Doppler was gently pro uh, placed on the dura and glued with a surgical glue. And thereafter, a kyphoplasty balloon was basically used. Now, kyphoplasty balloon can measure the pressure. And of course, as you keep on inflating the balloon, you can create increasing pressure on the spinal cord. This balloon was placed uh, in the lamina, uh, in the epidural space, so completely confined within the bone. So you could, you could put a lot of pressure on the spinal cord. This is the setup on the right upper hand side. That is the anesthesiology screen. You can see the map. At the bottom is the setup for spinal cord blood flow and the motor cord potential. Exposure has been done. You can see the shiny dura. And you can see the laser Doppler distally and the kyphoplasty balloon completely confined in the bony canal uh, proximally. So there were two parts to this experiment. In part one, we produced spinal cord injury in all 14 pigs. The way we did was the balloon was inflated 0.25 cc every five minutes until there was a loss of MEP. Once the MEPs were lost, the second part of the experiment was carried out. In this part, the interventions were started after the loss of MEPs. So we raised the blood pressure, we expanded the plasma volume, and we gave uh, some lidocaine. And based on the interventions, the pigs were divided into two groups. In group A, there were four pigs. The first step was phenylephrine to, to raise the blood pressure, followed five minutes later by colloids to expand the plasma volume. 
and then by lidocaine to serve as a membrane stabilizer. The last step was balloon deflation. 20 minutes after MEP lost, the balloon was deflated. In group B, 10 pigs, the balloon deflation was the first step. So almost immediately after MEP lost, balloon was deflated, followed by phenylephrine, colloids, and lidocaine. Pressure, MEP, spinal cord blood flow, mean artery pressure were recorded. Wake-up test was done at the end of the experiment, and two, three hours after the wake-up test, the pig was euthanized. A sectional spinal cord was central pathology. Postmodern, we did a CAT scan to measure the spinal cord canal volume. So let's look at the results. On the left-hand side, this is the baseline recordings. You can see the MEP, nice crest and trough. On the right side are the squiggly lines for the spinal cord blood flow. This is at baseline. 0.5 cc, again, MEP's crest and trough. On the right side, you still see the squiggly lines. At one cc, look at the bottom of the MEP chart. The crest and trough have disappeared. MEP loss has occurred. On the right-hand side, you can see a dip in the squiggly lines. I'm going to put the baseline measurement next to it, and that will help you better appreciate it. You can see the baseline spinal cord blood flow was at 120, 120, and at MEP loss, it decreased to 80. So there was a 30% decrease in the spinal cord blood flow when the MEP loss happened. But what was even more interesting, look at the white area of the chart, that around 3 to 30 minutes before, prior to the MEP loss, there was a 20% decrease in the spinal cord blood flow. And this occurred when the MEP was still present. Laser Doppler was able to detect this uh, hypoperfusion or ischemia before the loss of MEPs. Let's look at this graphically. The yellow thing here is the pressure. The blue is the space available, available for the core. As the pressure increased, as we cranked on the balloon, while well, the volume for the spinal cord decreased. Let's look at the MEPs in black here. As the pressure reached a critical number, 7 to 11 PSI, when the space for the cord was compromised by 75%, while well, MEP loss happened. Notice what's happening to the spinal cord blood flow. When the MEP loss happened, the spinal cord blood flow drastically dropped down. Notice what happened 3 to 32 minutes before that. Well, there is a decrease or hypoperfusion of the spinal cord blood flow, which was detected by laser. At this point of time, the pressure is subcritical, below 7 PSI, and about 50% of spinal cord has been compromised, or spinal canal has been compromised. But interestingly, at this time, MEPs are still present. So what does this mean? Well, if you had a laser Doppler and you're monitoring the spinal cord blood flow, when you see a hyperperfusion, you stop the surgery and reverse whatever you're doing, you will have a patient who is neurologically intact because the MEPs are still present. Let's look at what happens in group A. Remember, decompression was the last step. After balloon deflation, the spinal cord blood flow and MEPs are still low. They have not returned. So not surprisingly, all four pigs were paralyzed. In group B, when decompression was the first step, you can see an upswing of the spinal cord blood flow and MEPs, and they all return almost to baseline levels. Nine out of 10 pigs had neurological function. Seven were completely intact, only one paraplegia. And when we look at the h &E staining, there were hyperisnophilic neurons, ring hemorrhage, basically showing you vascular ischemia. So there were four critical findings. Cord ischemia was detected at least three minutes, an average 15 minutes before loss of MEPs when the injury was subclinical and preventable. And this is very important. Spinal cord blood flow change, more than 20% was detected before an MEP loss, giving surgeons a potential time to actually stop the surgery, abandon it, and save your patient. Volume compromise more than 50% or more than 60% was critical, but what was the most important lesson was immediate deflation of the balloon was neuroprotective. And what that means for you as surgeons is prompt decompression, remove the rod or the screws right away. It will help restore the spinal cord blood flow, return MEP signals and neurological function. There's nothing new. This is well known in the stroke literature. Time is brain. Speed is critical when confronting neurological hyperperfusion as every minute of ischemia to the brain 
destroys 2 million neurons. Let me repeat that. Every minute of ischemia to the spine destroys 2 million neurons, and after five minutes, the damage is irreversible. So this has been shown by others. Austin Back found that duration of ischemia influenced MEP recovery. Longer the ischemia prolonged was the recovery. Carlson found recovery directly related to duration of compression. Longer the duration, more difficult the, uh, the recovery. So speed is important. Rats with incomplete spinal cord blood flow were found to have a partial return or no return of motor function, just the way we had in group A, where decompression was the last step. So again, promptness is important. And why is this important? Because we have this checklist, especially in, in the United States, every operating room has this, what, what to do when you have an MVP loss. And I'm very uh, respectful of this checklist. My problem is the checklist is good at the start of the surgery. So if you have a pilot flying a plane, well, checklist at the start of the flight is fine. Checklist is not very important, very helpful when you have to crash land a plane or when your gear, landing gear is stuck uh, or you have run out of fuel or when you're driving a car and you're about to hit or get into an accident. At that time, the speed of your decision, the speed of your action and your experience and training will help. So this is what I tell you. My approach is like the, the most recent blockbuster, which is very popular in New York right now, RRR. Raise the map to more than 80, remove the rods and screws, and request a wake-up test. What happens when you're requesting a wake-up test is you're shutting down the anesthesia, which removes the confounding variable for MEP. Also, uh, requesting a wake-up test means the map will automatically start coming up. And this is another very popular song of the movie. And the reason New Yorkers love this is because there's a syn synchronized effort here between the two players. But what it is telling us is this step that I'm telling you is not a stepwise manner. It should be happening simultaneously. So when the anesthesiologist is raising the map, well, you should be removing the rods and screws. And while I'm waiting for the wake up test, I give blood for if the hematocrit is low, give lidocaine because it's a membrane stabilizer. There's a single case report by Dave Polly where the patient recovered with, with lidocaine. I repeat a CAT scan. I usually don't do it because I have intraoperative CAT scan available, which I've already confirmed my screws before I drop the rod. I'll abort the surgery if the wake up test fails. I will continue the surgery if the signals return and are reliable and reproducible. And I probably will continue the surgery if the wake up is fine, but I don't have the signals. In that case, I'll keep the patient wait, uh, uh, light, wake up the patient after each rod insertion. So I drop the left rod, wake the patient up, right rod, wake the patient up, and after final tightening. So in conclusion, spinal cord injury from compression is the end result of a cascade of increasing pressure, decreasing volume, and ischemia. Laser Doppler detects ischemia pre-injury, giving surgeons an opportunity for early intervention. Rapid de decompression leads to a return of MEP signals and function. Time is fine. Don't wait. Act. Raise the blood pressure, remove the rods and screws, and request for a wake-up because delay will lead to decay. That brings us to the second portion of this talk, neuroanatomical neuro safe zone for transverse approach. Again, a PIC study. EMGs are used in the lumbar interbody fusion surgery to safely navigate through a service in a transverse approach to avoid injury to the lumbar plexus. You all know EMG response less than five milliamps means direct nerve contact, five to 10 is close proximity and more than 10 is a safe zone. But despite all this, there are reports of nerve complications. Likisaz found almost 24% motor deficits. Amadi Anatol, who re reviewed 18 papers, found about 34% motor deficit and suggested that there is likely under-reporting of nerve injury. Well, that is concerning. So the question is, what is the accuracy and reliability of EMG in transverse approach? And what is the size of the psoas hematoma and or edema that forms from retractor blades in a transverse approach? This is because there are uh, studies that suggest that psoas hematoma may be the cause of the motor deficit after a transverse approach. Again, an IOQIC approved study, eight pigs underwent left retropenal approach to expose the psoas muscle. Once the nerve was identified, threshold for the first visible EMG response and for a 20 microvolt EMG response were elicited using both a ball tip and a needle tip probes. The probes were moved anteriorly 
in two millimeter increments. So zero, two, four, six, and eight, as well as 10 millimeter uh, distance. This is an, uh, there's a picture, the nerve, and the probe is sitting on the nerve. And second part of the study, we put, it, put in a guide wire about 10 millimeters anterior to, to the nerve through the psoas. Thereafter, a tubular retractor was inserted and the blades were opened. The retractor was then kept in place for about 30 minutes, which is what you need for a single level. The swines were then euthanized three hours later and CAT scan was done for hematoma. The opposite side psoas served as control. So let's look at the results. This is a CAT scan of the pig. No difference in size, no difference in attenuation of the hound's field units. So there was no hematoma, no edema that we saw on CAT scan in all eight pigs. Let's look at the EMG response. On the x-axis are the distance from the nerve, on the y-axis are the EMG threshold. Notice as the distance increased, the EMG response went up. But notice also that this response was not linear or directly proportional. For pig seven, it kept going up until six millimeters, but then an eight or 10, it decreased. Let's also look at two pigs who actually showed us safe zone EMGs, more than 10. But these pigs, the nerve was less than four millimeters. So the nerve was very close, yet the EMG suggested that we were safe. Let's look at this in a little more details. Eight pigs, six distances, 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. So a total of 48 readings. Of these 48, 31 times the EMG said we were in danger. 20 out of these 31 times, we were really in danger, less than four millimeters. So two out of three times, the EMG was correct. So a sensitivity of about 66%. Not very good, but acceptable. One out of three times, the EMG was wrong. We were safe, but the EMG said it was danger. So a false positive of one out of three or 33%. Now, I will give EMG some credit because realize in my experiment, the nerve was on the surface. As I moved away, there's a possibility that there was a nerve deep into the psoas that was being stimulated and EMG was actually being produced from that. So this is what I'll tell you. When the EMG tells you red, stop. Let's look at the 17 safe zones. 17 times EMG told us we were safe. 13 out of 17 times, so about 75%, we were really safe which is a good specificity. But what is concerning is four out of 17 times, so almost 25% times, it was falsely negative. So we were not really safe, but the EMG said, well, it is safe. So what's, what does that mean? Well, the EMG says green, well, I would say go carefully. So what does it all mean? Well, this is what's really happening. A probe really doesn't cause much that difference to the nerve. It's, it is really very benign. But when you put it in a cannula, the nerve gets displaced. And when you open the cannula, the nerve gets displaced even more. And if this continues for a long time, well, the nerve really gets unhappy and leads to neuropraxia. Think of it just the way you're retracting a nerve. You're pulling two things that are very important, the retraction, the pull, and the duration of that pull. And if you continue with that, then you can harm the nerve. And that's exactly what's happening. So really the duration of the surgery is causing the problem. So I will suggest the surgeon should be careful with the retractor, especially in a long surgery, as it can lead to neuropraxia. The best way to think of this is a tourniquet, basically monitor time and pressure. And since at present it is difficult to measure pressure, I will suggest it's a good practice that every 30 to 45 minutes, let go of the retractor and relieve the pressure on the nerve. So in conclusion, red means stop. Green means you need to follow your traffic rules. Don't be like this guy in any hurry. And when you're doing a long surgery, well, stop for a, a, a few minutes, remove your retractor, or let down the retractor. The muscle will be happy. The nerve will thank you. Just the way you're driving uh, on a long road trip with your family, if you stop on the roadside for some refreshments and use the bathroom, well, your family will thank you and your bladder will thank you too. And on that note, thank you.